Welcome back. My name's Rob Van Wagener. Uh, if you've been uh, following these videos and uh, uh, looking at the previous ones, you know that uh, I'm the author of a recently released novel entitled The Contortionist, a psychological thriller that deals with uh, 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 the aftermath of a missing child. I've read in my previous videos from the novel, and I'd like to do so again. I'd like to read from uh, the interview, the first interview between the police detective Milo Craig and the boy's mother, Melissa Christopher. The title of the chapter is Happy or Sad, It's Up to Me, 1.40 p.m. The Christophers was your standard kitchen, not the newest appliances, though neither were they ancient. 70s era formica and linoleum in blazing autumnal colors, cupboards that had seen better days. But it was clean and well organized, and the kitchen table appeared fairly new, a solid oak piece with tasteful chairs. The fridge exterior was a magnetized gallery of Joshua's artwork, a clipped cartoon or two, a few printed scriptures from the Book of Mormon, the kind of thing handed out in Relief Society or Sunday School. Craig took particular notice of one, quote, matted nicely behind a plexiglass holder. Happy or sad, it's up to me. I can make the right choice. Can I get you something to drink? Melissa Christopher asked. Coke, orange juice, water. I'm afraid we don't drink coffee, but I have some herbal tea. It was an effort. Her politeness, a simple gesture of Herculean proportions, and Craig's heart went out to her. It never ceased to amaze him, the gentle courage, the considerate graces offered by suffering people. Pain did not always bring out the worst in a person. Sometimes it distilled the very best. Mrs. Christopher was composed, entirely present. There was none of the distraction Craig had seen upon arriving, nothing of the fury he'd witnessed in the exchange with her husband only a few moments earlier. It was all gone, and Craig could not tell whether the resolve he saw now was artifice or the real thing. Either way, he admired it. Tea would be nice, thank you. He slipped his phone from his jacket and brought up the correct app. Showing her the device, he placed it on the table. Do you mind if I record our conversation? She turned away, shaking her head. Craig took a moment to watch her work. She was an attractive woman, late 20s or early 30s, a tad Rubenesque. She wore a loose jumper, her feet bare and white, the nails fire engine red, a welcome contrast to the yellow speckled linoleum floor. From where Craig sat, he could see the better part of her profile. As she filled the tea kettle, she pushed back her hair, lank and tangled now from her time outside, searching in the rain for her son. Catching her finger, she seemed for an instant aware of her disheveled condition, a ghost of recognition manifest in her labored return to a particular snarl. The corners of her eyes webbed with the effort, then she gave it up, her hair no less unruly than before. She shut off the tap and put the kettle on to boil. Turning, she anchored the heels of her hands on the counter behind her. Gravity weighted her pretty features, and her face seemed cast in wax, plied with a softening heat. Only her, only her eyes were hard, their connection with Craig's unwavering. My husband and I were suspects, I assume. Tough, this one. Craig couldn't help it. He liked her. Yes, ma'am. The parents are almost always suspects at the beginning of an investigation like this. She seemed strangely satisfied with the detective's answer. Opening a cupboard, she removed a mug and drinking glass. From another, she extracted a few boxes of bagged teas and set them on the counter. Without looking in Craig's direction, she asked, Chamomile, apple and cinnamon, orange spice? Chamomile, please. Head canted away, she wiped between, beneath each eye with the pad of a thumb, a quick surreptitious movement. She was not entirely able to suppress the moist hitch of her breath. She dried her thumb on the hip of her jumper. 
It is our fault, of course, she said, not looking at Craig. Mine, anyway. I should have walked Joshua to the party. She selected a bag of chamomile and dropped it in the mug, then returned the boxes to the cupboard. There are all sorts of things we'd do differently if we knew how they'd turn out, Craig said. She laughed tearfully. Josh loves being a big boy. He turned five two weeks ago. He was so proud of himself, finally old enough to start school in the fall. It used to make me nervous sending him to Billy's alone. I got used to it too soon, I guess. She pressed her sleeve to her upper lip, then spread both hands flat on the countertop. Isn't that what parenthood's all about? Learning to live with all the dangers we know we can't protect our children from. The warming kettle had begun to tick. Craig waited. She turned around and faced him. I'd do anything to bring him back. I will do anything. But I want you to know, except for sending Josh to Billy's alone, my husband and I had nothing to do with his disappearance. Craig nodded. I expect that's true. She studied him. The heat was still there, but Craig sensed no hostility. She stepped to the refrigerator and removed a two-liter bottle of Coke. It hissed when she unscrewed the lid. Do you think we'll find him? As though this were not the only question that mattered. She proceeded to fill the glass, then replaced the lid. Finally, she looked up, her moist eyes bright with anguish. I don't know, Mrs. Christopher. Usually we do. Sometimes when we find them, it's too late. And then there are times you never find them. Once in a while, yes. Thanks.